All right, and once again, welcome to Ask Us Anything. And today, of course, Johnny Heller is here and Tom Deere. And, of course, the first thing first, uh, Johnny, can you tell us a little bit about Mr. Deere? Sure. Uh, Tom Deere got his start as a uh, taxidermist. Um, and, and then and then and then uh, he, he talked to the uh, the animals and he didn't have enough animals to uh, stuff. So he, he went out on, on, at night and killed people's pets and then and then stuffed them and chatted with them amiably and decided, hey, I've got a good voice. I'm going to get in, into the voiceover game. And and since then, he's a really, really become an excellent taxidermist. <laughs> what a, so let, uh, background, Tom, why is your last you name need more? spelled so funny? <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you get now? I, by the way, this comes from somebody whose last name is perpetually looking like a typo to the, everybody else in the rest of the world. And I saw yours. And the first thing I thought is, ah, we must be distant relatives. How did you get that funny last? It's Belgian. It's Belgian. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. And legit then, huh? I, I guess at least what they told they told me. OK. <laughs> So why don't we change the subject here since that went so well? Please. Well, that, let's, let's, let's really ask Tom, Tom how, how did you start? Because uh, two things. One, how would you, if you're saying this is Tom Deere, he's a, how would you, you know, in not, no nasty things. How would you fill that in? And how did you start in the career that you're in? He's a storyteller. Uh, and I guess we'll, he'll be talking to, referring to himself in the third person for the rest of this. Cause that's right. Yes. You're, you're he's my, in the NBA. My leash, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, I'm a, a theater trained actor, uh, went to the national Shakespeare conservatory, not too far from here in, um, in midtown Manhattan, uh, wasn't a good fit for me. I left after a year. Uh, and then, um, I was living at home in New Jersey with my mother who was reading a copy of New Jersey monthly magazine. And she uh, asked me what's voiceover. And I'm like, I don't know. You like talk for money. And she's like, well, there's a coach uh, not too far from here. Cause she was reading the back of the New Jersey monthly magazine. There's like ads and classifieds. You, sh you should give her a try. So I gave her a call. She's like, yeah, come in for a diagnostic, did a diagnostic. I trained with her for six months, commercial uh, narration. But back in the nineties, that was pretty much the only kind of, uh, voiceover training that there really was. There wasn't all these specialty coaches. Um, and then uh, produced my uh, cassette tape demo, which I, yeah. I think I actually have here in the, I have here in the drawer. I, I, I had a reel to reel demo back in the day. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. So here's my cassette. Uh, yeah demo and uh, she gave me a little certificate and then a little and a stack of xerox copies of production company listings and she's like here's your certificate here's your demo here's a list of production companies start cold calling and good luck <laughs> and that was 1995 wow so yeah and there was no pay to plays there was no social media there was no home recording there was no online delivery there was nothing really there was just a you know, a demo in a dream. Uh, so I started my cold calling and I was cold calling sometimes 50 times a day to New York production companies and casting directors and ad agencies and uh, marketing firms and all that stuff. And it uh, took me a year to get my first gig, which is the uh, public service announcement for genital herpes awareness. Oh um, yeah. Every time I get herpes, I think of you as you should. <laughs> yeah. As you should, as you should. Um, it's on my sound. Too. It's on my SoundCloud channel. <laughs> if you want to hear the, uh, the herpes spot, but yeah, that was my first gig in uh, 1996. That's so. a great story. That, that, that's, the, that's the late night, uh, uh, whatever your late night guest shot is. That's the story you tell. Yes. The, your first gig for genital herpes, Her herpes awareness, herpes aware. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, must be aware imagine, of the herpes i imagine if you have it you're aware of it yeah but they were looking i would like to think, like to think so right? <laughs> so right <laughs> oh you should you should have seen the casting process many rounds many rounds of auditions many <laughs> rounds with many interesting well, people yeah back in the day the casting couch was was a big deal so yeah you fit right in oh yeah this yeah. was a cash this was a casting dumpster <laughs> out okay. in the alley C casting lazy boy yeah so yes. So when Casting you and I futon. first, so let's uh, change change the <laughs> subject just a slight bit. When you and I Please. first met, we were we were working uh, the New England Narrators Retreat, and we were talking mm -hmm. about business related stuff. Yes, and we were. One of the things that comes up all the time is, yeah, I have a great voice, which I'm not saying I do, but my mom you thinks do, I do. Yeah. And uh, but th but that's not the big deal, or it's it's a it's certainly important that I have a bunch of things going in, in the way I'm voicing, the, how I'm doing it. But on the business side, I see people falling off the wagon about every 15 minutes and going and doing something else because they think that just by having a good demo, 
that now I'm ready to go out and conquer the world. What are the first steps that somebody needs to take in order to get in this business and, and start to work towards success? Well, first, find a good coach and determine if you have any talent, frankly. Um, an interesting voice does not make you an effective storyteller. So having a deep voice or a quirky voice or a, you know, or whatever voice doesn't mean automatically you're a good storyteller. And the trend towards storytelling, being an effective storytelling, it's been going on for quite some time. You know, when I started in the 90s, you know, all the guys had these Hawaiian shirts with beer, you know, with beards, and they all sounded like this. And they automatically put their hand to their ear for the laughing guy. Um, but, uh, and I was, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Uh, when I decided when I decided to start, but when I discovered e-learning, which they needed people to sound like college students to help students all over the world learn English as a second language, then I was like, oh, okay, there is a there is a place for me. Um, but understanding after you get your coaching and you get an effective demo and you get your website and you get your home recording set up, you know, that's that's when people start to fall off the wagon, like you said, Don, because all the stuff that they were running away from in their nine to five job, in their soul crushing cubicles. Right. You have to do all of that stuff well, in the voice of the world, but there's no job description. There's right. nobody telling you to do it or how to do it or when to do it or why to do it. So project management, workflow, taxes, invoicing, marketing, like all that stuff that you had to do in your, in your poopy job that you're trying to run away from, you have to do. And that's when people realize, oh, I have to do grown up stuff. I don't get to just play and make squeaky sounds. Yeah. That's when most people go, okay, I can't, I can't do this. Yeah. Well, so how much should they take on themselves and how much do they hire out? Well, outsourcing, it's funny because there's like, a, there's a curve. There's like, I've noticed a, a curve for outsourcing. Um, at the beginning, I think you should learn. I think you should do everything on your own because you need to learn how it works and why it works. Like, if you want to be an audiobook narrator, you should engineer. I know this sounds terrible, but like you should probably engineer your own audiobook. You should record it all yourself. You should edit it all yourself. You should format it, process it, do all that stuff by yourself on your own. I mean, get as much, you know, input and education as you can from people like Johnny uh, and other people who understand how all this works because, and then when you outsource it, you know what the finished product is and you, you, you know what the, what the expectations are for the finished product is. And you also know what, what the process is like. So you're, you know, human to human sympathetic to it, but you understand the technicality of it because it will make you a better technical narrator if you understand what the editing process is like. So, but yeah, if you, Instead of filing, you know, if you want to file your taxes, hire a good accountant, someone who is better at you than it and more interested in doing it than you are, you know, and with social media. So I'm a huge proponent of outsourcing, but figure out, under, fail at all of it first. <laughs> Understand why you suck at it and how you suck at it and then hire an expert. Let, let, let me, I just want to say one thing because I love you to death, but when I, when I hear something that I have to um, respond to like that, Please. I yeah. need, I need to jump. Um, Here's the thing. I'll, I'll I'll be as clear. I agree with you for the most part that the more you know, the more that you know that you're not you can't do or can't do well, or that gets in the way of your job as an actor, the more you should outsource all that stuff. I think you need an understanding of what editors, masters, proofreaders, the people who make your audiobook uh, streaming ready, download digital ready. You should understand what they have to do. It doesn't, but I still don't know if I if I send. Um, I think Byron Wagner's on this thing, and some other guys who know how to do this. If if I send my audio, I do my wave files, and I do punch punch record, punch and roll. So now I know that I know what that means. Now I'm going to send these chapters, these wave files that I've done my condensed, whatever the hell it's called, and off they go through an FTP or a WeTransfer or whatever to Tom Deere Engineer, Tom Deere Master. Where, where, um, I don't know exactly what you do, and I'm not, but I know that I don't know. I also know that I don't want it. I just don't care. You know, I, I don't, I don't care what magic you weave to make it, to make it eligible so that when the audible person on the other audible listener downloads that book and hits play, they get what I did. That's what I want. 
whatever magic happens to make that happen, I don't give a rat's ass. I just want to do my acting and then do the next job. Okay, yes. but I'm going to step in here. So, yeah. And just like you would do to Tom, you're going to say, okay, well, this is what I disagree with. So, here's another point of view on that. So, you are 100% right. If anybody is close to your level and has done two, 300, 400, 500 books, that is awesome because they can get away with that because they have a publisher, they have all the stuff happening. If somebody's brand new, then they're starting from a totally different place. And while they do not need to ever get to the point where they can do all that stuff uh, 100%, today the tech is available that somebody new can have it set up and they actually could have fully mastered audio doing the exact same thing you're doing, which is recording and then exporting, and they can know a little bit about it. And probably the new person is not going to get away with the great situation that you had, which was you went in and an engineer did it, and you worked your way up the, the hard way back when you did it. Uh, they are going to have to know more because not only are they going to need to put in stuff in the beginning that is higher quality than what you had to originally because you had an engineer doing it. They're also going to have to put out more auditions than you are and having them having the ability to do their own auditions means they can audition within a very short period of time and get more work sooner so they can get to your level. So I'm, well, let, let, I'm, let, let, me, let me say, I, I, the auditions, I, I do the auditions. I, I agree with you. I'm not, I guess the, you should learn everything you can learn and decide if you even like it. I don't like the techie stuff Tom's talking about, that you're talking about. Yeah. But I know that I don't like it. So until right. you have, have until you've worn that hat, you may not know. But but even now, the audition process is they give you what do they give you? Yeah, it's probably the same. We'll talk about it in the other things that Tom does. But e-learning audiobooks, you get a page or two of the script. Right. You 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 narrate it in your in your Studio One in our case because the great Studio One guru is our leader here. Um, so we, you do it and and then you make an MP3 and send it off to you know. Uh, Tom Deere and Associates and say, here's my audition. Tom likes it or doesn't like it. Yeah. Tom? Well, all of this is also reconciling it with, with your comfort level. You know, yeah. Johnny is a certified Luddite. So, you know, he doesn't want to, he can't be bothered with, with the tech and, you know, makes him want to, you know, suck his thumb and crawl under the bed. Fine. Some people are technophiles. And so they want to dive into that. They want to get their hands dirty doing all that stuff. You know, some people love social media. And so when it comes to marketing, they want to do everything on their own because they just love the process of it. And other people are so anti so social media, they're just going to hire a social media manager and say, you take care of all of it. I don't want to be bothered with it. So everybody has their comfort level with technology, with social media, you know, all of this stuff. So you want to reconcile it all with that. I, for one, love spreadsheets. So I love analyzing my voiceover business, collecting data, figuring out how this marketing campaign worked or didn't work and why it worked or, or, or didn't work. Or how am I doing on an online casting site? Or how is my booking ratio with this rep with this manager or agent? So, you know, but to everybody, to the, the the point is, you need to under have a basic understanding of why and how the voice every aspect of the voiceover industry works the way it does to make you more efficient, to make you more effective, to make you more understanding of how and everything why everything works. So when you are a blue collar everyday voice actor, you're developing systems of thought and systems of execution and workflows. So everything that you do and everybody that you touch, whether it's your accountant, which I spent an, ex an hour work updating my spreadsheet. So when I file my taxes, the CPA can enter the data faster, you know, to making sure you understand Audible's specs. So you're not handing over audio that's too loud or that's too quiet, or to this, or to that. You know, you don't have to be an expert in everything, but learning, trying to do everything once to get an understanding of how it works and how it doesn't work will make you overall a better storyteller too, I, I, because you're spending that much less time focusing on the tech and more, more time focusing on being the storyteller that you got into this industry to be. I, I agree. I tend to be um, overly um, Luddite friendly because I, because my end, my end game in this kind of discussion, there, are, there, I know more than I say I do. There's two reasons I act like I don't. One is it gets people to do stuff for me, um, and 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 two, um, I want to make it clear to the actors out there, and that's our audience, 
that acting is still the most important part of the process. Not the only part, absolutely not. Because once the book's done, there's Mark, there's all kinds of things. And Tom brings up the other things that you never think about, that have to think about. The, um, the, 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 the tax burden, what's a write-off, what isn't. Um, keeping records, um, getting, getting the right equipment. Like, is this, is this still the right mic? As, as I age, and, and I might one day, um, is this the right mic for me? Like, stuff like that. Things you need to think about. But I get so, so demonstrative and forceful about the thing because I want actors to concentrate on performance because I think, as I've said before on this show and on, in, in many other situations, the biggest threat to the actors, the audiobook, the voiceover actor's life, lifeblood from AI comes if you're a bad performer, if yeah. you're not good. And I, yeah. just, I think that's, that's the biggest threat to our industry from it, um, not whether or not you know how to make an MP3. Yeah. Because you can Google that and find out. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I, on the other side of the coin, in all honesty, yeah, the more you know, yeah, I, maybe I wouldn't be such a Luddite if I learned a little bit about it and said, oh, my God, this is, this is kind of cool. I like doing this. And then, then I wouldn't hire somebody else. Well, but, let's uh, talk about yeah. social media. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tom, do you think it's uh, valuable and does it help anybody and is it worth spending any time on? <sighs> okay, I'm going to preface it by saying this, is that almost... Every voice seeker out there is paying absolutely no attention to anything that any of us are doing on social media. Why? Well, because they're too busy posting their content in a desperate hope that people will notice their stuff so they can get paid to do the things that they want to do. The most notable exception is audiobooks. And there's a, there's a reason why, because I know I'm looking at all the wonderful people. I see Paul and a bunch of other lovely people in our, our chat, and most of them are audiobook narrators, is that audiobook narrators are public figures. Audiobook narrators have followings of listeners, and they also have relationships that they've developed with authors who are also public figures. And they're trying to develop relationships with audiobook publishing companies, which are public companies in that most your average person has heard of Penguin or Random House just as a general book publisher. Me, who does a lot of e-learning and explainers, nobody's ever, most people have never heard of the explainer video narration production companies I've narrated. I've, I've been book stuffed through and nobody knows the name of most of the small to medium businesses that I've narrated explainer videos for. So my social media efforts for like putting myself out there as an explainer video narrator is pretty pointless. As an audiobook narrator, demonstrating your value as, an, as a storyteller and as a human is more important in social media circles because that social media content is being consumed by listeners. It is being consumed by authors and rights holders, and it is being consumed to a limited extent by audiobook publishing companies. They are paying more attention. So yeah, there it's more important to be active on social media as an audiobook narrator as it is for almost every other genre of voiceover, with the possible exception of cartoons and video games, but also for the same reason. They are also public figures with fans because audiobook narrators have fans. I know there's people out there that will listen to any book that Johnny narrates, regardless of the subject. You know, Andy yeah. Arndt and Tavia Gilbert and Dion Graham and Scott, uh, you know, Brick and a lot of other wonderful narrators, they have a following of them. They will listen to anything that they narrate. Therefore, it behooves them to be more active on social media, to be able to have a connection and have a relationship with them and nurture that relationship. And social media is a fantastic way to do that. Let me ask you a question based on that, because also one of the reasons, and you're absolutely correct, no no disagreement at all. Um, why am I here? Well, because um, yeah, you're <laughs> likable and I thought you'd buy me lunch. Um, I'm frankly disappointed that that's not happening. I, 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 I bought hope you so. lunch like a week ago. It's, we went, it's, we went to the Smith. Lunch time is every about? day, my friend. Every oh, day. for God's sake. Yeah. Anyway, so um, w when we talk about the social media aspect and whether it affects the e-learning people and the explainer video people and stuff, one of the reasons it's so important for the audiobook people is that most of the people who cast us from the public, from the, not just the authors, uh, the casting people from the uh, publishing houses tend to be uh, on social media. 
um, they're they're on. I mean, the, the Facebook and they're on Instagram and they're on TikTok. They're on these things. They're on these places. Um, a lot of casting people I've discovered is certainly currently have backgrounds in engineering and tech. They came from an engineering background. Many of them engineered <coughs> probably audiobook actors, and now they're in the casting game. Um, and a lot of them are on social media. So the actor who wishes to work in the genre of audiobooks should also be on social media because that's where the casting people are. That's also where authors are. There's something called, you know more about this than I, I expect, it's Discord, you know, that mm -hmm. server. Mm -hmm. now, I'm on Discord. Whole, that's huge in the uh, lit RPG fantasy kind of world. Uh, mm -hmm. I tried to get on it. Uh, I, I, I I didn't understand it. <laughs> so, so I didn't get anywhere. But um, <laughs> but I, yeah, yeah. so there's, <laughs> there's all kinds of things. Uh, my question, I guess then, Let's say I want to get involved in e-learning, explainer videos, and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, which, let's be honest about it, I think. Well, we'll talk about it in one second, but I, th there's money in those hills. Oh yeah. But where Where do you find the people to? Let's say I I work with Tom Deere, put together a great uh, e-learning demo. Mm -hmm. An e-learning demo is different than an explainer demo. Different than a a telephony demo. Blah, 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 yada yada. Yep yep, yep. Now I've got an e-learning demo, and it's fantastic. I mentioned Scott Brick has a great e-learning demo. Yes, JMC just produced a yeah, wonderful J demo. I listened to it. A great demo for him. Mm -hmm. um, so there it is. So you have okay. a great demo. Now what do you do? Here's okay. your demo. All right. I'm going to zoom out for a second. Some of my students who are in here have, know, have heard this before, is that in the voiceover industry, there are what I call portals, portals that connect voice actors to casting opportunities. And in the voiceover industry, there's basically three of them. There's representation which is agents and managers. There's online casting sites, which are a lot of free online casting sites like ACX or Ahab, Spoken Realms, Spotify, which a lot of your, our, your, our listeners are uh, familiar with, and pay-to-play ones like Voice123Voices.com, Bidalgo, VO Planet, et cetera. And then there's self-marketing tactics. So based on your definition of success, you look at the genres that you want to be successful at, and then you look at which one, two, or three of these portals should you be using to get the work that you want. So audiobooks, for example, agents don't cast audiobooks unless you're a celebrity. So you don't use that portal. Free online casting sites, ACX and whatnot, yes, there are dedicated ones for audiobooks. Use those. Self-marketing, using social media and other things, yes. E-learning, like audiobooks, Agents don't cast e-learning projects. I have gotten a handful of them over the years through my managers and my agents, but that's not something that's reliable. Online casting sites is the, is currently constituted, the place for relevance in e-learning. Uh, I am on Voice123. I'm auditioning every day. I am booking e-learning, corporate explainer, informational non-broadcast stuff regularly. Now, and, you, uh, th th there's a level you can join those things, right? So you're you're at the well, premium yes. level. Uh, I'm on, well, uh, Voices.com has one, has changed everything. They have one $500 tier for everything. W which is the one no one likes? Well, they don't, nobody likes any of them. They're all horrible. No, come on. There's <laughs> one that, th come on, one that everybody dumps on. Well, everybody dumps on Voices.com. That's what um, Right. Uh, but Voice123 has tiers, and I am on the second highest tier. The highest tier is $5,000. I'm on the second highest tier at $2,200 a year. Um, and I do great on it. I do really, really well. And I book a lot of commercials. I book a lot of explainers, corporate, industrial, and I book a fair amount of e-learning. Is it all non-union for you? It is all non-union for me. I am SAG eligible. Um, uh, so based on when, and when the, if and when the time is right, I'll make that union decision, but just the way my voiceover journey has gone, which has been primarily e-learning since 1997, it just hasn't gone there. <coughs> you know me. what I mean? Trust me. If that Class A national Coke spot that will pay for my grandkids' college tuition comes up, then, you know, okay, I'll make that decision. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But, Coke um, can pay for a lot of things. <laughs> yes, it can. So I've learned, I'm, yeah, we're actually in season two of Narcos Mexico right now. So yeah, I've learned that. Um, I'm not kidding. We were watching it last night. Great stuff. Diego Luna. Um, anyway, uh, but, and yes, there are self-marketing opportunities for e-learning, but it's, it's so much harder now because everybody is throwing their crappy emails with their crappy demos and their crappy, crappy marketing at all these e-learning companies when those e-learning companies can just jump onto a pay-to-play site and cast their voice actors without having to deal with this tidal wave 
of horrible marketing materials that they have to deal with every single day. So the short answer is pay to play, pay to play sites for people who are early in their journey is the best, most effective way to gain relevance in e-learning. As your voiceover journey progresses, things can change. And that's on a quick sidebar as the video strategist. I work with students of all experience levels, people that haven't produced a demo yet to people who have been in the business for 20 years. And the advice I give is vastly, vastly wildly different to people based on where they are in their voiceover journey and reconciled with their comfort level with technology or their comfort level with social media. So everybody's voiceover journey is different. It's unique because we're all a bunch of little snowflakes. We're all different. You know, we have our little preferences and idiosyncrasies and, you know, whatever. Yeah. So if someone was going to go to voices or voice one, two, three, and you're at, you're at tier level second from the top mm -hmm. and I'm just starting out <laughs> and I want to get in, what, what level, where's the entry level or what's the on-ramp that you would suggest if I were newer to it? Well, the thing is, is that there's like nine tiers or something like that, that are between $0 and $5,000. So you can do one for a hundred dollars or three or four or $500. However, your job to be a relevant voice actor is to feed the algorithms, feed the algorithms of search engine optimization, feed the algorithms of social media, feed the algorithms of pay to play sites. All of these platforms have different algorithms that you need to understand, figure out what it likes to eat and then feed it. Voice one, two, three, for example, the more that you pay for your subscription, the higher of a ranking you will have. In that, if you think of voice one, two, three as Google, and you think of your voice one, two, three uh, profile as a website. If you have a regular website, tombeer.com, donbarnes.com, johnnyheller.com, and you pay for SEO, search engine optimization, you do it to get higher rankings. So when Google or Bing or Yahoo is being used by somebody looking for a narrator or an engineer or a coach or whatever, the more you pay for SEO, the higher of a ranking you will have, the more likely you will get found. Voice one, two, three functions, at least my experience, pretty much the same way. So the more that you spend on your subscription, the more likely you will turn up in a search. Because voice one, two, three, for example, has two search, two algorithms. One, when people post a casting notice, and then the algorithm matches up the casting notice to voice actors in the database. And then there's one when you're actually, the voice actor is actually typing in search terms, male, voice actor, audiobook narrator, e-learning, whatever, and then search results come up of different voice actor profiles, and then they can reach out to individually, and contact directly for casting notices. So if you, you Don, and I all have um, an e-learning demo, and male, e-learning, um, English speaking, whatever. We all have mm -hmm. the same three or four uh, adjectives, definers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, get, if Don's at a hundred bucks, and I'm at 500 bucks, Mm -hmm. You'll get moved to the top of the heap because you're at $2,000, yeah? That is exactly right. Just like if you pay for SEO on Google, you're going to get found sooner. It's this, the principle's the same. And then the casting notice gets posted. The $5,000 people get a shot at it first, and then a little time goes by, and then it drops down to my $2,200 level, and then a little time it drops down to the 888 level, and so on and so forth. So do you recommend I start higher or I just, I do what I can afford? I do, well, uh, how, do if, how do you recommend I get started? If you're brand new, mm -hmm. there's a lot you need to do before you start dropping hundreds of dollars on it. I would start with the free profile and I would focus on optimizing your profile, which is uploading good samples and making sure that they're keyworded properly. That's the most important thing. Just like keywords are important for Google to find stuff. Keywords are critical on voice one, two, three for, for voice seekers to find voice actors. So understand how to build your profile, how to upload your samples and how to keyword them effectively. Get all that straightened out um, and then see what happens. Well, all that aside, the $888 tier, which is the third highest is the one that I have noticed is kind of the minimum to really start to see noticeable results and not get casting notices at two, three in the morning that have been over auditioned already. You know, so there is that. I, you so and like, I discussed this as well. I know for a fact, based on our discussions, that the two thousand dollars that you paid per year to get in mm -hmm. has already it pays for itself with a few jobs right away. Yes. So, well, see, that's the other myth, myth or misconception about Voice One Two Three is that there are quality production companies who are paying standard non-union, and there are union casting notices on there. So obviously, they're you know, contractually obligated to post to pay union rates, there are good rates 
all over the place on voice one, two, three. And so, yeah, a few gigs. Yeah. I make my, I make my money back very quickly on voice one, two, three. Do you have uh, the ability to negotiate? If I, if the rate says it's a, I don't know how much these things are, 500 bucks for the gig, Mm -hmm. let's say. Is that what it is, or do you have room to negotiate because you're Tom Deere? It depends on the uh, depends on how the const- casting notice is is construed. Sometimes they say this is a locked rate, five hundred dollars, take it or leave it. Sometimes it'll say our budget is up to five hundred dollars, and then you can post a quote, and then you can click a button that says whether it's negotiable or non negotiable, mm-hmm. or it'll say what do you charge? What are you charging for this? So it 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 depends. What I've noticed the most is that when I submit a bid, higher end bid. If not a highest bid, those are the stuff I tend to get the most often. Like even one time I put in a quote is for some short corporate thing of a few minutes. And I quoted 600 bucks for like five, 10 minutes or whatever it was, which is a good rate. A few days later, they call me and they say, uh, two other, you're on the short list. The two other two guys quoted 500. If you quote 500, the job is yours. I'm like, okay. (laughs) So so I said 500. They're like, you got the job. And I got, and I, and then a couple of days later, (laughs) a couple of days later, I booked it. So, you know, I recorded it and sent it off and everything. And then they paid me through the platform, which is a 100% guarantee of getting paid. And there you go. So pay to play sites can be about a part of a balanced breakfast for a voice actor at almost any point in their journey. It should not be the whole meal. Yeah. It should be a combination of representation, online casting sites, and self-marketing. The tricky part is what percentage of effort should you put in and time and money into any of those portals? Because you have no idea what results you're going to get. You know what I mean? Like I do analytics of my voiceover business every year. I just looked, finished up all my numbers and 12% of my revenue came from representation and 50% came from online casting sites, both free and pay to play. And then the balance was self-marketing. Now that doesn't mean that's what yours will be or should be, but I'm noticing the effort that I'm putting in and what's coming out. What's interesting is that my representation percentage booking started going up once I started auditioning regularly on voice one, two, three. Because more popular guy, I be no, I became a better auditioner. Ah, so since I became a better auditioner on Voice One Two Three, I became a better auditioner through my agents. And this past year, I I booked for me the most money in commercials ever, including a T-Mobile spot, which I think went online today, which I got through an agent. But I got lots of high quality, good commercials through Voice One Two Three and other free online casting sites. Well, so. And, and all, the other thing that happens, if you're doing this a lot and you, you keep working it every single day, uh, you, I'm going to assume, get a whole lot better at doing this stuff, better at auditions, better at voicing the commercials, better at, at delivering the products, better yeah. at every aspect yeah. of your well, business, correct? 2019, uh, 1% of my gigs came from representation. 2020 is when I joined the $888 tier. Uh, 2022 was the first time I joined the $2,200 tier. And now my representation revenue is up to 12%. I am, I'm looking at a correlation between the quality and quantity of auditions that I'm putting out and the, what I'm getting back, which is more work on voice one, two, three, and more, vo- more work through my reps because I'm just a better auditioner. And that is there's being a good storyteller and there's being a good auditioner. Yes. And yes. there's a lot of over, there's a lot of overlap, but <laughs> yeah, you have to be a good be auditioner. You have yeah. to be good at both. Uh, right. I, well, I, I know that when I was, uh, when I did some, I wrote, wrote some off-Broadway stuff and we did, uh, the casting was interesting. Um, mm. Some people were brilliant at auditioning and then sadly you'd give them the job and they couldn't do the, they couldn't do, they couldn't play the, ca- the role. They were really good at auditioning. It's not the same thing. Let's, because this is called Ask Us Anything and we rarely actually answer anybody's questions, Let's take a look. There at are them. a bunch of them. There's I know. Yes, a few. Yeah. They're backing first, up. First, but here's Bruce Kramer. And let me just say this. Bruce. Okay. Bruce. Now, um, Former student. Love yes. Bruce. Tom, given your good experience with Voices123, do you even bother with Voices.com at this point? I do. I do. And I book, I don't, I'm newer to the Voices.com platform. So therefore I have not fed the algorithm for as long a period of time. So I haven't had the same a return on it, but I'm still on there. If for no other reason this, who's going to spend more on their SEO in 2024? Tom Deere with his meager income, at least related to voices.com, who's going to probably spend hundreds of thousands of dollars 
on their search engine optimization. Because also remember this, everybody, search engine optimization is not just a function of the quality of your website. It's also a function of your online presence, other websites. So if you Google yourself, is your website going to come up first? Maybe. But if you're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, who spend m -m millions of dollars on search engine optimization, their stuff is going to come up. Which what I'm my point is that ride as many SEO coattails as you can be on bigger websites to increase your overall online presence. So yeah, I am I'm doing it on uh, Voices.com and I'm booking a little bit, but again, I'm I only re, I only joined it in September. So um, you know, and their and their algorithm is different, and it likes to eat different things, and it needs to be fed in different ways. I've been on Voice One Two Three since two thousand six, yeah. so I'm just much more familiar with it. So you um, and and for most people, if I start tomorrow and I put a listing up and it's my first listing, should mm -hmm. I expect to make a hundred thousand dollars over the next three months? I mean, what, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. What does it no. take? I mean, wh so what are you seeing across the? Let's just in three months, am I going to have an idea of how this is going to return? But uh, maybe. I mean, I'll put it to you this way: I've noticed that. If you want to be an effective voice actor in 2024, which is only two days old, so I've seen a lot in these two days, um, <laughs> is that you need to be relevant in the voiceover industry. It used to be auditioning 10 to 15 times a day in the aggregate of the three plat of the three portals: representation, online casting, self marketing. Say that again. Um, How many times a day? 10 to 15 times a day. 10 to 15 you should, times a day. Okay, you should be so, you should be auditioning 10 to 15 times a day. And and if, those auditions are how long each? Well, that's the thing. I'll put it to you this way. On a good day, I'm at my desk. Well, on most days, I'm at my desk at 730 auditioning. And I open up my inbox and I have Voice123 auditions. I have Voices.com auditions. I have agent auditions. I have manager auditions. And then I have self-marketing auditions through production companies or legacy clients or whatever. On a good day, I can do eight auditions in 30 minutes. Okay. Eight. Eight. Okay. That means I'm spending less than five minutes I'm spending roughly, yeah, I'm spending less than five minutes on an audition because I have turned myself into an auditioning machine. Right. Because it's a numbers game. And and just as a, a rough, since you have a lot of statistics, how many auditions would you do in an average year, just so people have perspective, that you're not just sitting waiting there for the bonbons to come being fed in your mouth, you're actually going out. Do you have those? <laughs> Of course I have those. <laughs> Who are you talking to, Don? I, I will tell you that in 2023, I auditioned 1,854 times. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> 1,854. It averages to, it averages to uh, seven, di seven times a day. If on a weekday, you know, if I'm auditioning 50, you know, oh, 50 you weeks out of the year. Because you, yeah. you, you really did 5.079452 per day. Right. You didn't do the weekends. Okay. So, right. And it's funny. It's funny. I do audition on weekends pretty regularly. I squeeze out a couple I squeeze yeah. out a couple auditions in the morning before I, I start. Your, yeah. Let's keep your squeezing it out to yourself, shall we? <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Okay. But that's good. For, it's, it's a very important thing to note. That you're doing, we'll just call it uh, eight to fifteen auditions per day, mm -hmm. because people think that they go ahead and if they just do, I did twenty five auditions, I did thirty auditions. You're right. doing that in three days. Yeah. And and people, and that's kind of, I mean, gee, do you think that uh, adds to your success? Hundred percent. Again, like I said, it makes me the more you audition, unless you really are a lousy storyteller and you didn't get any training or you didn't get good training, it's just gonna make you a better storyteller. Just gonna make you better at your job. You know, you're just gonna you, you know what I mean? And that's yeah. that's what it is. That's really what it okay, is. Okay, so you're yes, also it's a it's, ta it's talent. Yes. Yeah, it's acting, it's storytelling, but it's getting in reps. It's yeah. you know, your body. Your body, you your brain, your this. brain is smarter than you are. Your brain is smarter you than you are. Your muscles are smarter than you are. They like repetition. They like to be fed. They like to be healthy, and they like to be consistently working. So use that to your advantage. So that's why I can bang out eight auditions in thirty minutes. Okay. Well, see, you know? I, I I agree because like I meant it. You need the at bats if you want to be yeah. a better if you want to be a better ball player. You got You got to stand in and take the swings. Yeah. So there are some other questions. I know Paul had uh, hey, a question before him was. Um, a question I've, I've got it was from I Alana, see one maybe. right oh 
um, about, um, we'll get to Paul in one second. Alana sure. said something about she doesn't see that many, I think she said, oh. doesn't see that many um, union oh, auditions. Oh, union. That's because uh, there aren't that many. There are, right. That's what I thought. There's some. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, but not a lot. I, I would suggest most of those union auditions, most auditions at a union go through uh, repre representation, go to agents a lot. They do. Yeah. But what's also great is that you can be a union voice actor on Voice123 or Voices.com. And if the uh, the budget for the casting notice is high enough and lines up with the collective collective bargaining agreement in question for that particular type of project on SAG-AFTRA, you can use a, a pay, paymaster like Falcon Paymaster or Tim Friedlander and get it converted into a union gig without even having to tell the client. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can just yeah, the, the money do goes it on to your the paymaster. Own. Yeah. Yeah, you can set up the invoicing and the invoices go to your paymaster. They pay the paymaster. The paymaster takes out the fees and health and pension and whatever and sends you the, the difference. So, you know, it's just a matter of understanding what the rate structure is for the each each CBA and then look being able to break down a casting notice on a pay to play and knowing what the budget is and auditioning or not auditioning if the budget isn't right. Let's go. Let's go to Paul's question. And I want to say one thing. You guys listen out there. You're really Tom Deere really knows this stuff. If you want to know more about how to get your business set up, what to do, how to make these things happen, uh, what's it, VOStrategist.com, I believe? VOStrategist.com, yes. Yeah, there's, the, I've, I'm sure I've known, well, he's one of my best friends. I've known him for God forever. It's it's not just because he buys me lunch. It's more. He, he also gives me free information, but he knows stuff. He simply knows it, and he knows it. I, I am not nearly as, uh, <laughs> my business is not quite as put together as Tommy. I've, I've yeah. had the, I've had the great fortune of uh, being successful and 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 just riding it. I haven't I don't do all that stuff, but what well, Tommy knows is really amazing. And, Thank you. And, well, Johnny, also remember you're a you're you're focusing primarily on one genre. You know, yeah. I I have I do or have done almost every single genre, with the exception of like imaging. You know. I have percentages of income every year of almost every genre. So that requires me to do and know a lot of other things. So, but don't, don't let that, don't let that detract from your, from your talent and your success as a, as a gifted and award-winning audiobook narrator. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, I, Who will I, buy I, me I think eventually. I'm fantastic. Don't worry. Um, what, <laughs> did I spell, the, I, b b before we move on, did I spell Vo strategist.com. Yes, that's exactly oh, right. Yeah. I thought, so <laughs> okay. now back to the questions. Let's others. go back to Paul, because I think okay. he was next up in the parade there. If I want to find representation, Representation, Polly, in um, in e-learning, you mean? Agents, I think he's referring. And I know, but is, does he mean specifically in that genre or in a general? Because we oh, all know audiobooks don't get representation. Right. But if you're talking about e-learning, commercial, that kind of thing, um, well, let's start with that, and then it's then. Yeah. And okay. Well, to answer the general question of getting any kind of representation, what you need to demonstrate to a prospective agent to be considered is value. When it comes to us as voice actors, there's value demonstration, and value delivery. Value demonstration is you're the new Mexican restaurant in town. So you put out all these flyers and do all these advertising and, hey, we've got a, you know, we've got a talking tamale and, you know, <laughs> free candy for the kids or whatever. Come on down. That's, that's demonstrate, trying to demonstrate their value. Then you go to the restaurant, how clean the bathroom is, how clean the forks are, how soon it's for you to take to get sat. How quickly do they take your order? Did the food come out fast? Did the food come out hot? Did the food come out correctly? Did the server check on you? That's value delivery. Voice actors have to do the same exact thing. As in, you demonstrate your value on social media, through this, through that. But if for agents, you demonstrate your value by showing them the work that you've done. And the, it used to be like, oh, you can't get work without an agent. You can't get an agent without work. Well, that's clearly not true. That's clearly not true anymore because there are these portals of online casting sites and self-marketing that you can get work in, develop your skills, develop your portfolio, demonstrate your value. But one of the most important things for a prospective agent is a, a good quality demo, a high quality demo. There are demo producers out there who make demos designed to be submitted specifically for representation. Um, that's, the, that's the big thing. So agents want to see your body of work. They want to hear a really, really good demo. And, and this is more important, much more important than it used to be. How are you comporting yourself in public? So remember when I said that voice seekers aren't paying any attention to what you're doing on social media? 
Well, the times they are paying attention to you on social media is looking at you online to see if you're an NDA violator. They're looking to see if you are a complainer about clients. And they're looking to see if you're some kind of political or, you know, religious whack job that could do reputational or legal or financial damage to their place of business. So if you're on social media, if no other reason, make sure that you're able to demonstrate that, that you are a a, a sober, thoughtful, good human. <laughs> <laughs> not, not literally sober. I mean, that would probably help. I, I, but, I will know. share some information. I, I always share we in any discussion on social media. People post a lot of things under the mistaken idea that everybody on social media is their friend, is their supporter, cares about them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. or that what they said in a fit of Pike's Peak will be forgotten the next day, as though it's an argument with your wife or best friend. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. When you post, whatever you post lives for pretty much ever. It's there. Social media is not a safe place. It isn't. So if you're going to say things, I try and say things in a humorous way so I get away with a lot of stuff. But it doesn't always work for everybody. And also, I I, I never... It, it, let, let's, say, let's say I want to write a, a, a letter to Tom Deere's really pissed me off. Don Barnes has really pissed me off. Well, don't ever post anything in in the middle of the emotion. It just doesn't make sense. Take time to think about it. A lot of times what I recommend, and some of you guys agree, I'll write a letter. I won't send it. I'll, I won't, I'll, leave the sub, I'll leave the subject and the two part blank. Don Barnes, I'm damn sick and tardy, and I write it all out. I get everything out, and then I read it, and then it's out. And then later on, I'll say, dear Don, regarding the other day, let's have a chat. About, you know, so all of a sudden, I've gotten all my enmity and anger and nonsense out. I haven't shared it on social media. Yeah. You've got you've got to be aware that it, that it lives and what you write lives and people do whatever they think of Tom, Don or Johnny right now, we can change that positive feeling in 2 seconds with some absurdist nonsense and that we, we post in a fit in, in when we're just you know in Tom's case high on, on cocaine. But yeah. the rest of us so yeah, we you've just got to I be lie right now. <laughs> That's why he doesn't want lunch. I'm not hungry, man. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> well, but, well, so a, a little trick that I have, by the way, that I do and have done for uh, close to I don't know five, six, seven years. If I'm in a heated discussion with somebody, or let's say somebody posts something that I think is just inappropriate, uh, a lot of times what I will do is I will wait an hour, five hours. And then I will post as if I haven't seen the other persons and I do not tag them so that my response is first Facebook. Uh, let's just talk Facebook. It hides a bunch of stuff from other people. So you may never have seen the first thing that caused whatever, but I try not to tag anybody if I disagree with them. So I don't want to have it be a direct me against them if I can avoid it uh, unless they tag me first. And then I, you know, hey, uh, that changes the, the equation. But in other words, I avoid direct attacks. I'm not perfect about that. I avoid them. I, and if I do find, I'll go in and take something out later. But I also will reply to a, something that I totally disagreed with uh, a few hours later and not make it a, a, a one-on-one disagreement if I can. Okay. Now, if, if you've been doing it as long as I've been doing it, it does happen at points. Uh, I've been in ker- kerfuffles over the years with a few people, but it's, I can count them on one hand. And the rest of them, it's all just wait, just wait, just wait. And I just try to chill out a little bit. All right, but let's change subject on that uh, because that's a, that's a very specific thing. There's a question well, here about the F word, speaking of this kind of stuff. Really? Yes, yes. What about the F word? Ben oh, Fiverr. <sighs> okay. I thought, Fiver. I thought he was calling me out. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, well, you covered it up behind you. I did. Look, okay. I covered it. Now, here's the interesting thing. He says, you know, now, full disclosure, I'm not on it, and professionals have collaborated with us. They no. That it undercuts the industry. What are your thoughts? Okay. Okay. This is a sticky right. one. Okay. I have a Fiverr account. Mm-hmm. I know Johnny just went. Rrr. The reason <laughs> he Johnny didn't like you, Tom. No, no. I am aware of that. It just means I got no. It's like I got nothing to lose. The reason I created a Fiverr account is because, as the VO strategist, it's my responsibility to understand every aspect of the voiceover industry, so I can give objective information and people can collect data and then make decisions in a thoughtful manner so they can decide how to move their voiceover business forward, okay? So I did 
what I called the Great Fiverr Experiment. And I was on it. Uh, I created an account. I watched YouTube videos. I looked at tutorials. I figured out how to optimize my account, how to set it up, and then try to get and try to get work. So here's a here's the thing that you need to understand about the the st structurally how Fiverr works. The first first off is when it says all where it says there's just people all over there doing voiceover work that should be hundreds of thousands of dollars and doing it only for five bucks. Is that true? The answer is sometimes, but you create what's called a gig on Fiverr. Um, Voices.com and Voice123 have copied this and made their own version of that to compete with Fiverr. So let's say I'm going to do an, let's say I'm, I'm an explainer video narrator. I've done hundreds of explainers. So let's say I do one, which I usually charge like around $400 for. Okay. So I'll create a gig, which is basically like a package and it'll be Tom Deere will narrate your explainer video. And it'll have the first entry will be like, how much for the initial recording? Let's just say, and I don't do that. I hadn't done this. You enter $5. Then you say, then there's a line that says, oh, they want it as a wave file. Okay, add $20 to that. Oh, retake policy. You'll allow two, re two retakes. Oh, we'll add $50. Oh, uh, directed session. Okay, add another $50. So if you add it all up, it'll be $400. It's just that Fiverr gives you the opportunity to itemize all of the stuff that would come with any of us narrating an explain your video for, it's just that off the top of our heads, we go, oh, it's $400. But then you look at the script and maybe you make a correction in the script and, oh, they want to direct you. Okay. So you do that. Oh, okay. Oh, they want to retake. Okay. But in your head, all that stuff is already included in that $400. Fiverr just breaks it down for you. So you can charge industry standard rates on Fiverr. You just fill in the little, fill in the boxes for what each item on that gig calls for, and then it's $400 or, or whatever it is. So, uh, I did that and I did all my research. I built my gigs. I optimized my stuff. I did all the research and did everything. And I booked nothing. Now, why did I book nothing? Is it because Tom Deere sucks? Maybe like voice one, two, three and voices.com have algorithms that need to be fed. Fiverr has algorithms that need to be fed as well. Fiverr has basically three levels. You start, and if you generate a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time and get a certain amount of favorable reviews in a certain amount of time on Fiverr, they will upgrade you to the next level. And then the same thing, certain amount of gigs, certain amount of uh, reviews, they up you to the, to the highest level. Once you get to that highest level, then the algorithm is working with you. And there are people on there who are making six figure salaries, but they're not doing it $5 at a time. They're doing yeah. it two, three, four, five, six hundred dollars or even more at a time on Fiverr. The trick is, is to be able to get from that base, that, that bottom level to that top level. Yeah. Here's the other thing that I noticed on it is that we look at everything being that the majority of the people who are on this and other, you know, voiceover platforms that I've had conversations with about subjects like this, we are all Americans. We uh, live in the strongest economy in the world. A $400 explainer video here isn't worth $400 in Jakarta, for example. So if there's a client on Fiverr of a Jakartan production company who is offering, I don't know, $30 for it, is it because they're a bunch of cheapskate bastards? Maybe, but maybe it's more likely that's just what the Jakartan economy can handle. So if I'm an American voice actor who has American expenses, rent, utilities, food, bills, gas, whatever, you know, do I do that gig? Well, if you understand how the algorithm works, maybe you do do that gig because you're supporting the Jakartan, you know, economic structure. You're not compromising their principles. They're pay they're paying you what to them is a is a industry standard rate. So maybe you do enough of those to get you to that next level. Here's where the problem comes in with Fiverr. It's when a production company from Chicago is trying to pay you $30 $30. Yeah. to do that $400 gig and American voice actors are accepting it. That's when it's a problem. Yeah. Now, Fiverr wasn't twirling its mustache to destroy the voiceover industry by allowing the structure of the of the, of it to accommodate lower rates. I'm sure that's not what they were doing. I can't speak to their algorithm 
beyond what I've just shared, and I can't speak to their mission statement. I'm sure you can look it up and find it somewhere. But my point is this, you bring your ethics to everywhere that you go. There are a certain percentage of people in every single industry all over the world that are scumbags, okay? Regardless, dentistry, machiner, you know, m machinists, you know, uh, hotel management, there's a certain percentage, since humans are there, a certain percentage of them are scum. So no matter what you build or what you create or what you try to sell, there's going to be a certain percentage of people who will try to take advantage of it and take advantage of other people. The question is, what are you bringing to it? If you bring a, your value system, your ethics, your values to it, then you can make money on Fiverr and be successful on it. It's just, it's just to get over that hump of, you know, are you comfortable? Of the, yeah. uh, well, not the scumbaggery. It's working with an ethical Jakartian production company that can only afford to pay you thirty dollars for of an explainer that you in America would charge four hundred dollars for. But you can might you take that, that thirty dollar deal if they're, if they're ethical and you're ethical. You may take that thirty dollar deal just to bring you up in the Fiverr algorithm. Exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. Well, so, and uh, just for disclaimer, I do know I, I do know somebody that in running in my circles that uh, single months earns north of uh, eighteen thousand dollars a month on yeah Twitter. and they're not doing it five dollars at a time because there isn't there isn't I mean, enough like, there isn't enough time to make to do right. that to make that kind right. of money at five dollars so, at a time i mean i, I one time got, went wait a minute you're <clears> earning <throat> equivalent of two hundred thousand dollars a year doing that and he's like mm -hmm. yep so i mean yeah first off like everything else there's exceptions and so i don't buy into this it's it's going to ruin the industry it is a worldwide uh, situation and you get to pick what you choose to do and you don't need to do things that don't make any sense and don't go take things at 20 bucks that are worth hundreds here but once again yeah. if you're doing with a company that was say over in the middle east or something that that may be a bad whatever wherever they are if in their economy and it works because you're not busy that day you get a chance to practice too so there's that as well so i've just yeah. seen all tiers yeah, yeah. i've seen people do dumb things on it i've seen people make crazy amounts of money on it mm -hmm. and i just suspect they ain't going away they're they're the seo thing the thing i see they're spending millions of dollars a year advertising like voice one two three mm -hmm. and so they are pulling in people around the world that need voice services and yeah. uh, it's it's the, the only changing. thing that may really screw up fiverr if they don't are able to if they're not able to accommodate is ai yeah. Because if someone's willing, to, if a, if an American voice seeker is willing to pay an American voice actor five dollars to do their explainer video, the 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 taking the step to just having an AI voice do it, it's not a it's not yeah. a hard it's not a hard reach. Absolutely. And so you know, so there there is that. So and Johnny and I had a conversation about this over lunch. Is that AI may separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, when it comes to voice actors, you know, good voice actors, good storytellers, good actors, which Johnny extols the virtue of, as he should, you know, the, those people, if you're a good actor and you're a good storyteller, you will continue to get work. If you're a lousy voice actor or a lousy storyteller who doesn't have your business hat on, yeah, AI is going to eat you alive. And my sympathy is limited. Yeah. Uh, so you, in other words, if, could I summarize that by saying you need to be a complete package you need to get coaching so your storytelling is is really uh, first class or on the way toward excellence. First off, mm -hmm. we're all striving. No, I don't think anyone's arrived at excellence. It's one of these forever paths that we're on. And yeah, then it's in the rear of your mirror for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, there is an exception to everything. And he occasionally looks in the rear of your mirror behind him to view excellence. Just, <laughs> it, oh, isn't that cute? Yeah. But then, where I am godlike now. In addition to the storytelling, there's another part of business. One of the, I, get, I think one of the problems is people don't realize that their brand, they are a business, and if you're going to, if you're newer in this thing, you have different facets of every business that you're going to need to deal with. And Tom is brilliant at putting together strategies to help you get to where you want to get much faster. Can you do this on your own? I'm sure you can. Are you smart to leverage the people that have gone before you and spent the last 10 or 15 years in this business, like Heller, like Tom, uh, in order to get something done in less time? And one of the factors I think people don't take into account is that you and I are competing with others out there. And some people just have more resources to invest 
And if you don't, then you need to find ways to get scrappier about it because I also have seen people su uh, succeed in this business by doing more than a lot of other people. And then you can talk to Tom when he's at conferences, when he's at the New England Narrators Retreat and get some of his insights. Uh, if you can, go hire him tomorrow. I mean, go Absolutely. hire Johnny tomorrow. I mean, you, you really are missing it if you're not hiring Heller, if you're not hiring someone like Tom in order to get the different aspects all firing together and working as a team. And I totally agree with Johnny. If your storytelling isn't good, no one's hiring Don Barnes. I'm not a great storyteller. I'm okay. Uh, I, do, I do more voiceover work than most people know, but that's only because my wife is so good at it that she gets side gigs, So, and she needs me for that. If she wasn't married to me, she would never use me, but that's a different discussion, <laughs> okay? So, but, so if I, if I, but I have the other aspects covered, if I wanted to be good, I would be coaching every as soon as I could with a, with a Heller and with Joanna and making that happen because I need to combine both. I can't just be a great storyteller, although when you get to Johnny's point, yes, you can. Um, you can work your way up to that. But it is a business that requires quite a few hats for us to wear. And in the beginning, you might wear a lot of them. And then you're finding expertise that you can learn from, grab from. And that's these two guys right here. And, and, and when you're motivated to act is the time you should act. Um, when Tom said uh, um, he became better at auditioning. Yeah. Well, I, I have a commercial agent and I'm not getting that many auditions. I mean, I, I'm not winning them. So during this call, actually, I looked down and I, I sent a quick text to my commercial coach and said, I really need to be better at auditioning. So do you want me to just uh, do more one-on-ones or get in a group with you? Because I want to be, I want to win. The, I can, I win um, some of my audiobook auditions, not all, but I'm not winning my commercial auditions. And I used to win them all the time. So what's changed? Sometimes Tom wears a lot of hats. I wear a lot of hats. Don wears a lot of hats. If we're doing an e-learning, an explainer, uh, audiobook, and 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 an animation commercial or something, and all in the same day, that's you, you don't do one. There's different takes, different styles, different genres. You need to understand. You need to be different. And I'm wondering, from my personally, is my work in the audiobook industry negatively impacting my work as a commercial guy? And it probably is. So I need to concentrate more on getting in the right mindset to do the commercial audition, which is different than the audiobook audition. And so you need to work with, you need to, you need to be coached on so many things. I know it's expensive, but you know what? So what? That's what business is all about. College costs a lot of money too. And you had to go there or you didn't have to, or at least somebody had a scholarship. Um, but you know, but you know, when, when you want to be good at a thing, you've got to take it seriously and learn the best ways. And Tom Deere, VO strategist, is an excellent way to get your business off the ground to understand more. I mean, look, how, he, look how easily and readily he answers every question we toss his way. There's no script here. He just, he knows his stuff. I, I mean, he's not just a great friend of mine. I just think he's, he's a great resource uh, for almost everything. And I just think that you're making a mistake. We're, we're, Don and I are trying to bring people who are great in so many different things, but Tom Deere is, uh, Tom Deere's a guy you should definitely investigate studying with, plain and simple. All right, Tom, any last words before we wrap up for today? Anything now? First, you have VOStrategist.com. They need to check that out. Uh, yes, they go to VO. contact you 24-7. Can you give us their direct phone number so I can call in the middle of the night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get right on that. Okay. Uh, but you can book a free 15-minute consult with me at VOStrategist.com. And also, I encourage you to vet me. Go to TomDeer.com and check out my voice actor page because I can't really, um, you know, demonstrate value or deliver values to VO strategists if I'm not delivering value as a relevant voice actor. So go to tomdeer.com, check it out, listen to my demos, watch my YouTube videos, and also follow my blog, subscribe to me on YouTube, uh, connect with me on Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, yes, check camp out outside my, my house. <laughs> camp outside my house, you know, play say any, you know, play uh, Peter Gabriel on your boombox. <laughs> Uh, um, and uh, yes, and Ron is going to be taking my e-learning class via Skills Hub on January 10th. I also do some genre exploration classes. You know, also feel free to check out my videos. Um, I have a video library on VOStrategist.com. I just lowered all the prices. All the prices went down uh, on at my videos, and you know, so much stuff. So many, you know, use my use my website as voiceover Google's because I've got a ton of information there, and I would love to work with each and every one of you.
Fantastic. All right. Well, we appreciate you being here. And uh, Johnny, do you remember who we have next week? Uh, is it Simon Vance? I, That's the way I, I've got it right here. All right. Uh, uh, Anna Clements. Oh, Anna Clements. All right. She's Anna's awesome. with us next week. Yes. Yes. So, so here's the thing. Uh, Johnny and I have been racking our brains, and we have we're booked out for like the next three months. It's crazy. Almost nobody has said no to us when we've asked them. It's just been incredible, and it's because you're watching this that we're getting so many great people that are willing to come on and see this. So we thank you for, yeah, I know a bunch of you are telling other people because I see the numbers that are happening every week and how many people are watching the replays. And so we are extremely thankful and grateful that you're doing that. Keep doing that. It's so helpful for us. Put, throw comments in after the show is over. Super helpful. Be sure to subscribe. And as always, we'll see you next week on The Wires. You have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.